Hello, everybody. I am so glad that you have taken the time out of your busy schedule to join us. Uh, let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, we come to say thank you. Thank you for bringing us together again. And as always, we ask that you would open our hearts and minds to receive you afresh. In Jesus' name, amen. I am so happy that you joined us again today. Uh, we are continuing on article number 11, The Perseverance of Saints. And our author writes, We believe that such only are real believers as endure until the end, that their persevering attachment to Christ is the grand mark which distinguishes them from superficial professors that a special providence watches over their welfare, and that they are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. And our main scripture continues to be John the 8th chapter, verses 31 and 32. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And our focus has been and continues to be on the latter part of verse 32, and the truth will set you free. And our subtopic under that heading is our third declaration of freedom, freedom from discouragement, no frustration. And that's found in Romans, the eighth chapter, verses 18 through 30. And we have been looking at verse 28, a very familiar verse, <clears throat> which says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And so we said that the promises of God, uh, or the promise of God working all things for good, is not for everybody. It can be. But the conflict, the tension, is that not everybody loves God. God will overrule and work through even the toughest circumstances, the toughest tragedies that we may encounter in, in this sinful world. There is no situation that God cannot work through, no human God cannot touch. No chain of authority that he cannot reach. There are no doors he cannot open. None that he cannot close. The things that God can and will do are endless for those who love him. Now that does not mean that God is not concerned about the people that do not love him. The amazing thing is that God has chosen to love all of us, the whole world. He is always waiting with open arms to receive us. If you recall, uh, we paused our study right here uh, to take what I call the scenic route and to look at an amazing view of just how much the Father loves us. And to the extent to which he has gone to show us that love. The message version of John 3.16 says, This is how much God loved the world. He gave his son, his one and only son. And this is why. So that no one need to be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. And so we've been looking at the first chapters, the first verses of chapter 3, uh, to start at the beginning of Nicodemus's encounter with Jesus. So Jesus, being the master teacher, used several illustrations to instruct his student in the basics of salvation. The first illustration 
was to explain being born again. Jesus used the experience of birth, being born, which is something that all humans are quite familiar with. Because if you're here, you were born. But that proved to just confuse Nicodemus. Nicodemus could not understand how a fully grown man could be born again a second time. I see, when I read that, I see at least two things uh, that Nicodemus picked up on that kept him searching. The first was, Jesus started his statement with the words, no one. If, if you look at the King James Version, it says, except a man. Those words must have been like a bolt of lightning, hitting him dead center in his theology and in his belief. His belief and his theology. He, he believed that his Jewish birth, and especially his Jewish birth with his status, gave him an automatic entry into the kingdom of God. He believed that the kingdom of God would be filled with people just like him. But Jesus was teaching a, a fundamental truth that had just turned his world upside down. Jesus taught that it was not a natural birth, nor being a descendant of, from the stock of Israel, but a second birth, being born anew, with a complete spiritual change is what admits one into the kingdom of God. So when Jesus said, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born again, Nicodemus knew that he was part of the no one. It, it was like, it, it's like waiting in, a, in, in line to board an airplane. And getting to the gate and finding out that you have the wrong ticket. Can you imagine the frustration and, and, and the confusion that would occur? And, and so that's the first thing that he realized is that he was part of the no one. Then the second thing uh, that Nicodemus picked up on was hope. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born again. That word unless, uh, and then in the King James Version, it says except. Uh, though that word unless or except is what separates the haves and the have nots. And it has nothing to do with, with money. It has nothing to do with social status. It gives hope. It offers the possibility that it could happen. Hope helps to fight off discouragement. Jesse James, everybody remember Jesse James. Jesse Jackson slogan back during the civil rights movement was keep hope alive. Hope is Fueled with possibilities. Keeping hope alive. It's like keeping a reservoir of strength that can be tapped in when, when, at any time when you need it. Uh, uh, a couple years ago, or at least I think it was a couple years ago, it, it's hard to know these days, you know, what happened when. Uh, but at some time in the not so distant past, my husband and I took a tour of the Hoover Dam. It's in Black Canyon on the Colorado River. It connects Nevada and Arizona. It is called one of the modern day uh, civil engineering wonders of the United States. Why? Because it provided hope to people when it seemed like 
all hope was lost. The, Cor Co oh, the Colorado River at one time was an uncontrollable raging torrent. It, it was flood fertile valleys along its banks and, and destroyed farms and homes and even cities. It, 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 in the spring, it would flood. And, and then after its fury, everything would completely dry up, dry as a bone, leaving man, livestock, and all things to suffer from the lack of water. Then, through some years of labor, uh, they worked on this thing 24-7, 365 days per year. And, and with the use of lots and lots of concrete, the dam, Hoover Dam, and can canals were built to control the river and to hold reservoirs of water that could be directed to farmlands along the river, even as far away as Mexico, which saved the, the, the farmers, it saved the, the farmland, it saved the valleys, it saved uh, cities. Of course, it, it, the Hoover Dam is a lot more complicated than that, but that is my simple way of putting it to get the point across. Hope it is like those reservoirs. I read that hope is like an emotional reservoir of strength. It is like when folk do me wrong, for no fault of my own, I can tap into my emotional reservoir of hope for the strength not to get evil. If I, if I get a bad report from the doctor, or if the economy affects my house, or if things don't go the way I plan, instead of getting depressed and just give up, I can tap into my emotional reservoir of hope for the strength to keep going. When I face temptations of all kinds, when, when I'm tempted to just throw in the towel and say, what's the use? I can tap into my emotional reservoir of hope for the strength to hold fast, to hang in there and not give up. In this voting season, when my mind tells me that my vote won't count because them folk going to do what they going to do, my emotional reservoir of hope helps me to squash those thoughts and instead plan my vote then work my plan. Keep hope alive. I should also point out that hope is based on something. It, it is backed up by something. It has a foundation. It's not just wishful thinking. Wishful thinking, it, it would be like boxing with the wind. You can't win. The songwriter said, and they said it right. He, who, the songwriter said, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Then he says, on Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Then, then I, I, I was looking at it and, and saw the, the next verse, which I hadn't noticed before. It says, when darkness veil, veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. My reservoir of strength, of hope, is based on his unchanging grace found in the word of God. So when Nicodemus understood that he was part of the group that would not see the kingdom of God unless he was born again, he heard hope. Hope that came from the Son of God, the Word made flesh, which means that his hope had a solid foundation. 
So he sought to understand this mysterious requirement called born again. Uh, of course, Nicodemus was speaking about, of course, Jesus was speaking about spiritual things, but Nicodemus was focused on the physical. Now you would think that with all of his education and, and the fact that he was a religious leader, he would have known that, that Jesus was not talking about physical birth. Even common sense would have probably told you that. Uh, of course, at least not in the way that, that Nicodemus was thinking of it. But then that's a, a, a great example of spiritual blindness. And it shows that spiritual blindness has no respect of person. From the most educated to the lowest of learning, we all have had and have been spiritually blind. And some are still in that condition. But thank God that he freely gives sight. We don't have to remain blind. There's a commercial that has made its way back on the airways. It, it kind of goes and comes and, and now it, it's it's back again uh, with Ron Reagan, the son of the former president. Uh, his purpose is to get more support for the separation of church and state. And at the end of the commercial, he makes the confession that he is a lifelong atheist that is not afraid of burning in hell. Every time I hear that, I say to myself, that's what you say now. Then I think he really should have a conversation with the rich man in, in Luke, the 16th chapter, that died and went to hell and was in torment. He was in hell pleading for mercy, which is an impossible request. Mercy is for the living. There's no mercy in hell. But that's another lesson. This man wanted Lazarus, the same man that he would have nothing to do with while he was alive. Now he wanted him, Lazarus, to dip, dip the tip of his finger in water to cool his tongue. You ever stop to think about that? He was asking the father to send Lazarus from the comfort of the father's bosom to hell to experience torment just to satisfy his momentarily selfish desire. Even in hell, he wanted to treat Lazarus with contempt. He, he said, I am in agony in this fire. Can you imagine being in such agony that water, not scooped in the hand, not, not a pitcher full, but from the tip of someone's finger seems soothing. That's agony. And that's agony I don't want to ever face. That type of torment, even for a moment. But can you imagine for eternity? That's unthinkable. So, so when Ron Reagan, in a snarky voice, fashion, says he is not afraid of burning in hell, that's a great example of the blindness of sin and of sinners. So even though Nicodemus was well-educated and a religious leader, he was blind in the things of God. Next, in, in verse 5, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. Jesus goes to where Nicodemus is 
to try and bring him into a spiritual understanding. That even if he could go back into his mother's womb to be born a second time, he would still not be qualified to enter the kingdom of God. Because flesh could only give birth to flesh. And with that, I'm closing this study session. Otherwise, I would be like the preacher who says, I'm closing. I'm closing now. And 15 minutes later, his closing is still going on. So, I am closing and I have closed. Join us again next week as we continue with Nicodemus's visit with the Master. Until then, be strong, take heart, all you who hope in the Lord, be blessed. Thanks for your comments. Thanks for uh, coming back and, and, and uh, joining us. And until next time, be blessed.